Hello, if you're studying GCSE Media Studies with the AQA exam board uh, and you're doing your exam during 2017, that means your topic is TV game shows. In this video, I'm going to completely outline everything you could possibly want to know about TV game shows. Now there are four key concepts in media studies and we're going to look at TV game shows from all four of them. So they are media language, institutions, audiences and representation. Okay, so let's start off with the media language. Now, media language literally refers to all of the conventions that we expect of a genre. So it'll be the camera angles, the sounds, the structure, and we're gonna look at those with some specific examples. Now, it seems to make sense that a good place to start would be with uh, opening title sequences. These short sequences are used to very quickly establish the themes of a TV game show and also start creating enigmas for the audience to want answers to. So our first example is going to be University Challenge. Challenge. First thing I noticed was the use of music. Here we've got quite a fast-paced, uh, simple violin piece, which we associate with classical culture, a higher level of thinking, academics, and we associate that with, uh, you know, great thinkers, which is ultimately what we're seeing in, in this show. Then we've got the visuals, and we can see symbols inside these bubbles, and they're denoting uh, different academic fields, so medicine, art, history, astronomy, the type of subjects that the contestants in this show will be specializing in at their universities. Now what about the bubbles themselves? Why are they there? Well, I think that they could perhaps represent atoms, part of a molecular structure, which we have connotations for um, in science, you know, one of the most academic subjects you can do at university. Or perhaps the bubbles are representative of planets, in which case this could be um, an interpretation of the universe, which is obviously one of the, the, the concept which has been a source of intrigue for some of the greatest minds in history. And then we have this electrical kind of effect going on between the bubbles. What could they mean? Well, I think that could kind of represent the uh, electrical activity of our brains as we think. Ultimately, you know, the representation of, of what it means to be human, intelligence. All of these things are symbols for uh, intellect, great thinking, sophistication. And these are themes that we see throughout the show. So let's look at one more example of a TV game show's opening sequence, The Chase. This is a TV game show with a very obvious, unique selling point. Stay ahead of the chasers by answering questions, fail to answer the questions, and the chaser will catch you. Now let's see how this theme of chase is represented through the sequence. First, we notice the color palette, all red with black and white accents. Now in direct contrast to the neutral blue color of University Challenge, the red connotes far more danger and risk. This straight away feels like a much more tense TV game show. The next thing I notice with the speed lines in the background, which give us far more pace and creates a sense of urgency. The music is far more dramatic than University Challenge, and it's got this very dramatic minor tone to it, which it, it, it's kind of contributing to a sense of narrative already. We're going to discuss that a bit more. And then finally, we've got the actual imagery, and we have these kind of graphical representations of the chaser and the contestants. And unlike with University Challenge, we're actually getting a, a kind of like a basic narrative here. The contestants are trying to escape with something while the chaser is looking everywhere for them. He's represented as an all-seeing angular figure who casts a long shadow over the title. He's dangerous and he means the contestants harm. So to again contrast with University Challenge, this is far more mainstream. We're trying to hook in as many people as we can. It offers uh, the excitement of the chase, a rough narrative of escape. You could argue that Barthes' Enigma Codes theory applies to this sequence. The audience is left asking, who's being chased? Who is that chaser? Are they going to escape? Next up in media language, let's talk about sets, the mise-en-scene. Now, the set is a hugely important part of a TV game show because just like the opening sequence, they need to completely convey the themes, the idea, the unique selling point of the TV game show, visually. I think the set for Tipping Point is a really great starting point to talk about sets. 
Now the whole design of this set is very typical of TV game shows, which is to say it's very colourful, it's very bright and it's quite in your face. It's quite easy to spot straight away that the, um, the inspiration for this set is Vegas, casinos, the big lights. So we have the same neon lights and the big signs which connote the big city, gambling, big prizes. In fact, the whole set is designed to resemble a slot machine. Purple seems to be the primary colour used throughout the set, but this changes depending on what's happening. So here's an example. Early rounds, we're meeting the contestants and getting to grips with the format of the show. So the rather neutral colours of blue and purple are unthreatening and light. As we progress to the later rounds, these colours change to orange and reds. The danger is greater and there is more at stake if lost. It's also interesting to note the positioning of everything in this set. The contestants are facing the game board, indicating that they are competing with the game rather than directly with each other. And the host is between the contestants and the board, acting as a sort of mediator. So what else do we notice about this set beyond the use of um, bright colours? Well, use of geometric shapes, that's something you'll find in a lot of TV game shows. Now here, we're kind of seeing an upside down trapeze shape, which at first might not mean an awful lot, but when you consider the unique selling point of this show is to play the, um, to play the coin machine where your winnings are literally in the balance. I think these um, top heavy geometric shapes are again, they're conveying this idea of balance and tipping because they are literally balancing on a smaller point. You see it everywhere in the podiums, in the background, around the actual machine. Okay, now let's talk about um, a very, very different set, Ninja Warrior UK. Now, it's very hard to look at this without straight away uh, noticing the amount of Union Jack references in the, uh, the color palette. Now, why do this? The whole premise of this show is finding the most elite, the best athletes that our country has to offer. So naturally, there's going to be a sense of patriotism there. Um, and we see the red, white and blue absolutely everywhere in the lighting with the actual flags. I think the overall reason for this is to establish that these athletes are the best that this country has to offer. They're representing the UK. The next thing I spotted was the use of scaffolding. Now, very often with the elaborate sets you see in TV game shows, they'll go to great lengths to try and hide the fact that this is a set. Whereas with Ninja Warrior UK, we, we literally have scaffolding. It's very obvious that we're in a studio, this huge warehouse. Now, I think the reason they've done that is to um, convey a sense of danger. You know, uh, we, we can literally see how the set is being held up, where it's supported. Um, and again, it adds an element of elitism, uh, an element of risk and danger to what these people are doing. Um, that ultimately means that the likes of you and me, the average person watching at home, we couldn't do this, these people are. It also adds a sense of grandeur, a sense of scale, these huge set. It's not just a small studio that will fit tens of people, it will fit hundreds. This is a massive set, a big deal, and it's almost like an arena. You know, it's almost like going to see a, uh, a big spectator sport. Finally, the other thing I want to talk about with the set in Ninja Warrior UK is the fact that the audience is actually facing us at home. We can actually see them. Now, why do this? When you look at the, the likes of Tipping Point and Pointless, we're aware that the audience is there. Perhaps sometimes we might get a cutaway to see them or see them just on the edge of the screen, but we never see them directly. With Ninja Warrior UK, they are directly facing us. And I think the reason for that is, the premise of this show is, you kind of want to see them fall. You want to kind of see the, the crowd cheering them on and being excited, but also laughing at them when they fail. And it almost makes you more aware of the audience by facing us. And the effect that that has is it makes us feel part of the audience. We're there in the stadium with them. We've got the loud noises, we've got the explosions, we've got the fireworks, and we get to laugh, sigh, and cheer whenever the audience does. So the next thing I want to talk about in terms of media language is the sound used in TV game shows. Now, sound is used primarily for two reasons in TV game shows. One, to gradually build tension throughout the course of the episode but also to provide instant feedback as to whether challenges have been passed or failed. So let's stick with Tipping Point as an example. Throughout the episode, music is used very deliberately to build tension. So very, very quietly in the background, you can hear in this example, it's similar to almost kind of Mission Impossible style infiltration music. Oh, that's looking good. Silver one, gonna go for you. It's quite intense, it's not too loud and it connotes 
this high stakes, delicate nature of the task. We don't want to disturb this balance. You could almost imagine kind of like diffusing a bomb to this kind of music. It's very delicate, but very tense. Sound effects are used to provide instant feedback to the audience as to whether or not the answers that the contestants have gone for and inevitably the audience at home, whether it was right or wrong. So we have the correct answer noise. Yes. Oh, good. Excellent. And the incorrect answer noise. <laughs> Again, these act as a sense of reward when you're right and a sense of building tension if you're wrong. And then the other thing that we'll see in almost all TV game shows is the use of short stings to signal a change in rounds, going from perhaps the bonus round to the final round. See you in a bit. Now this is just another form of signposting, indicating that one part of the show is finished and another one is about to begin. So in this sense, it serves more of a narrative kind of purpose. Here's the exact same thing done in Pointless to indicate the end of one round and the start of another. But for the remaining three pairs, it's now time for round two. Well, look at that, we've all made it into round two. Moving on, I wanna talk about structure and narrative in TV game shows. Now, as I've already mentioned, TV game shows typically follow a round structure. Okay, so let's start off with Pointless as a really good example. We establish the rules in no more than two sentences. Hello, I'm Alexander Armstrong and welcome to Pointless, the show where the lowest scorers are the biggest winners. Let's meet today's players. We then get a chance to meet the hosts and they share a little bit of banter and we get to know them a bit more. We then get to meet the guests during the opening rounds, uh, which is a very, very um, easy kind of light version of the game. So we also get to understand the format of the show. Then we begin the knockout process in the middle rounds. We go through a head to head and then we have the final where the show's namesake comes into play and they have to get a pointless answer to win the prize. Now, this is a great example of where we can apply Todorov because we're so programmed straight away to seek the resolve of any kind of disruption which is ultimately always going to be do they win or do they lose that by the time we get to the end of this episode and we're actually invested in the characters we want to know um their fate okay the next thing i want to talk about in terms of media language is the camera angles now there are several conventional camera angles which you'd expect in any TV game shows. And I want to talk about some examples which you're going to find in uh, Pointless, University Challenge, and Tipping Point. So across the board, we're always going to see a sweeping crane shot, usually moving up, up a ways. Now, I think that this, on the one hand, this gives a sense of scale. We get to see the grandeur of the, uh, of the set. Now, the other more important reason we see this is, is if we look at when it actually happens, it usually happens at the start of the show and between rounds. Now, since the camera is moving up a ways, we almost get the sense that we are, um, we almost get the sense that we're going up a level. Things are getting harder, and um, just like the tension that we see in the music, things are getting more difficult. Next, we tend to stick to mid shots whenever we see the contestants. Now, why is this? We don't get so many kind of close ups and we don't want to be so far away from the contestants as to be at a long shot. The mid shot is very natural. It's kind of it's what we're used to when we're interacting with people in our daily lives. So it allows us to get to know the characters. We're close to them, but we're not so close that it's uncomfortable in an extreme close up. Next, we'll very often experience a long shot. Um, now, this is what you might see kind of like so that we can see the contestants and the board at the same time. It allows us, it, it's more of an informative shot. It allows us to see what's happening in the state of the game. Sometimes we'll also see a picture in picture or a PIP. Um, and the reason for this is as the contestant is giving their big answer, we want to see the game board, but we also want to see their reaction when they win and we see their joy or when they lose and we see their misery. And one other generic thing that I want to talk about across the board is the only people you will ever see talking to the camera is the host. You'll see that the contestants, they interact with the host or maybe the co-host or the board, but they don't look at the camera. The host is the only person who does that. And the reason for that is they are our guide. They are kind of like the conduit um, between us at home and the actual show. So uh, we'll be signposted, we'll be directed. Here's what's going to happen now. And we know that they're directing us by looking at the camera. For Ricky and Craig, it's now time for our pointless fun. Now, there are a couple of um, specific camera angles that you might find in specific shows I want to talk about. 
What I want to talk about is University Challenge, and you can't help but notice this crash zoom on contestants whenever they buzz in for an answer and when we first meet them. Now, why do this? Um, I think the reason for this is it goes back to the heritage of the show when it first started in the 1950s. Why they did it then, I'm not entirely sure. I think perhaps it gives it a sense of pace. This is quite a quick show where, you know, the host will often say, come on, hurry up. Uh, they don't have time to mess around and get to know you. It's very quick and very efficient. But as to why we still do it now, yes, those reasons still apply. But also, I think for such a long established show, they've not wanted to change the conventions. Even the set and the uh, the nameplates of the universities in the set, they, they're exactly the same as they looked back in the 1950s. And I think it almost pays homage to the, um, uh, the heritage of the show. Another example I want to give is Ninja Warrior UK, where we get this side-scrolling tracking shot. It's kind of a dolly shot. Um, and I think it's interesting because it, it almost reminds me of like a platformer in a video game where the contestants have to hop, jump and skip across all these various obstacles and we literally track along with them like we would in a video game. And the final thing I want to talk about for media language is on-screen graphics. Now across the board very often you will be presented at certain points with the specific visuals that the contestants will be able to see in the studio. So we at home as we play along we're able to uh, participate and feel like we're actually part of the show and like I say it kind of allows for audience participation at home. Okay, the next key concept that we've got to talk about is institution. Who makes the media? How do they make money? Why do they make the show? Naturally, the first place I've got to start is with financing. Where does the money come from? Now, I want to start off with the BBC and their show Pointless. Now, the BBC fund their shows through the TV license, which the taxpayer pays for. And they have a mandate from the government to create shows which educate, entertain and inform. Now, because of this, uh, you can imagine the BBC comes under a lot of fire, I think personally, quite unnecessarily, about how they spend their money. If they feel like they're overspending on a certain area, they come under flack. Um, but in the same way, they've got to produce something which is to a good enough standard that people want to watch it. Now, Pointless is an interesting one because it's made on a shoestring budget. They're able to churn out episodes uh, very, very easily, even though they can't perhaps uh, compete with some of the production values of the likes of Ninja Warrior on ITV. Here's a great quote I found from the co-host Richard Osman, who's also the show's co-founder. He says that there's no need for bells and whistles, you can film more shows with the BBC. He said, we have a very cheap show to make. It is made on an incredibly tight budget. As soon as you do stuff on the BBC, it is much cheaper, and that way we record four shows a day. Now, for all of my research, I couldn't actually find uh, the budget of a single episode of Pointless. The nearest thing I found was this very interesting tweet from Richard Osman again. He said, And for those who think the BBC waste money, you can make 24 episodes of Pointless Celebrities for the same price of one episode of The X Factor. Now, that's quite indicative of, one, how expensive The X Factor is, but two, how cheap Pointless is, how uh, economical it is. I mean, there's evidence of it elsewhere. The fact that in Pointless, the, the prize fund is usually uh, a couple of thousand pounds compared to the likes of uh, the million pound drop, where it's a million pounds on ITV. Now let's compare that directly with an ITV show. Obviously ITV were the first uh, TV channel in the UK to be funded by advertising. And obviously this means they're going to try harder to attract the mainstream audience, get as many people as watching as they can. But it also means they'll have more money to uh, produce perhaps more spectacle, have bigger prize funds. So when you look at public funding of the BBC and advertised funding uh, through ITV, you can see the way that it's funded is going to have a direct effect on the production values. The next thing I want to talk about is marketing. Now, there are numerous different ways uh, in the 21st century that uh, people can get into a game show, but also explore it more if they are already a fan of the show. So let's start off with board games. Um, like I've said several times already, the whole point of TV game shows is they're interactive. They, they allow you to participate at home from your armchair. So what better way to uh, take this a step further than the board games? I mean, look at this example with Pointless. It's a great example of cross-media convergence where you can actually play the board game and do some answers on your mobile phone. It's a great way of making additional money to uh, supplement the show. It's a great way of getting the brand out there in the shops. And it, like I've said, it allows for participation with the audience. Mobile phones are also hugely important in terms of apps, which you've probably seen on, on the likes of the iPhone App Store. Um, games which are only going to cost about £1.99, such as this example for uh, Tipping Point, can be hugely popular. Tipping Point is an example which was for a very, very long time in the UK top 10 of the uh, Apple 
download store will have likely made thousands, if not millions, just from app purchases. And yet again, we're getting uh, the chance for the audience to participate, to, uh, to play along. Another very, very recent example is Five Gold Rings, a show that's just started on ITV, but it offers a free app where you're actually allowed to play along live with the show. This is a great example of cross-media convergence and synergy where the app is working to advertise the show and the show is going to point you in the direction of the app. Twitter's used really, really well to uh, market Pointless. You should probably go along and take a look at the Twitter feed now for more up-to-date tweets. But what you'll find is at the start of every single show, they will tweet out an alert that the show is starting, but also screen grabs of actual questions from the show. So even on the go, even when you're checking your phone at school or at work, you're reminded that Pointless is always on and it's always got fun questions you can play along with. The website provides really easy access to watch previous episodes. It also allows us to meet the hosts so we get that social kind of like interaction with them. We get to know them better. Uh, it also allows us to play along with kind of like mini quizzes, mini versions of the game. Pointless is another great example on the BBC. And finally, a really great example of synergy in terms of marketing is Tipping Point working with Sky Bingo. So Sky Bingo uh, in their online service actually offer the Tipping Point game. Now again, this is synergy because it means people who love the show are likely to want to try it out on Sky Bingo. Um, it also means people who, who are introduced to the show via Sky Bingo are going to be drawn to the show. So two different companies working in, in synergy with each other there. The next part of institution I want to talk about is scheduling, when the TV shows are actually on. Now, interestingly, if you look at this graphic, the peak viewing times for television is around about 8, 9 o'clock in terms of actual numbers. So whenever you see TV game shows, you'll notice they're always on kind of like between 5 and 7 o'clock. Now, why is that? It's kind of, it's a nice introduction to um, the, the peak hours. But I think more importantly, it's when people are most commonly going to be putting on the TV as they get home from work or from school. And like we said earlier, with that circular narrative of Todorov, it means no matter when you get back, if it's bang on five or quarter past five, half past five, it means these shows are very easy to jump into. It's a, it's a nice, easy welcome home program. It's not an intensive narrative. It means you can just jump straight into it. The second most common kind of place that you're going to find a TV game show is uh, Saturday prime time. So you're looking kind of around about uh, seven or eight o'clock now. So this is, interestingly enough, this is where uh, Pointless Celebrities is on the weekend, as opposed to being between like five and six o'clock on the weekday. It has a slightly later showing um, on the weekend. Now, again, this is because people less commonly work on the weekend and that kind of peak time to kind of grab the, uh, the audience is going to be slightly earlier evening. One interesting statistic about Pointless that I found online was that the BBC One show was watched by an average of 5.92 million viewers between 6 and 7 on the weekend. Okay, next key concept, let's talk about audience. Who watches uh, TV game shows and why do they watch them? Now, what you'll often find is that most commonly TV game shows attempt to grab uh, as large an audience as they can. You won't get many niche audiences. So let's first off um, outline those two types of audience. A niche audience is one where there is a very, very uh, specific interest. In other words, it's not going to have mass appeal. Uh, for, for example, Gardener's World, that's going to appeal to gardeners. Um, a mass audience is something that appeals to the mainstream, absolutely everybody. And obviously it goes without saying that that's where there's going to be more money because you'll be able to charge more for advertising because you can say you've got higher figures. So let's look at this as an example. Um, University Challenge is a far more niche audience than the likes of Pointless. Um, and I think the reason for that is the, the level of questioning in University Challenge isn't going to appeal to just everybody. They can actually be quite alienating to someone who perhaps isn't at university uh, standard of education. Whereas when we look at the likes of Pointless or Tipping Point, you're going to find far more questions which are to do with pop culture, movies, music, that sort of thing. So the next one I want to talk about segmenting the audience is the socioeconomic model. Now this uh, characterizes audiences based roughly on their social group which is linked to their income. So what we have is this uh, grid which uh, details um, A, B, C1, C2, D and E. Now just very very briefly you'll find that uh, group A means 
upper class, which is more kind of like higher managerial roles. Then we have kind of like the B groups, which is more intermediate uh, managerial. For the more kind of, uh, you know, the average middle class, 25 to 50,000 pound annual income. Then we get down to like the C1s and the C2s. These are more kind of like uh, trained professions. And then we move down to D and E, which might be indicative of uh, pensioners, uh, students, unskilled workers. Now, how does this work in terms of TV game shows? Just to use those same examples again, we can quite easily say that uh, University Challenge is probably going to uh, appeal to more of the top end of that spectrum. So maybe um, A to C1. It goes without saying that there's going to be a higher degree of education to engage with some of these questions. And it just goes without saying that the higher degree of education is often going to result in a higher income packet. So for University Challenge, I'd say it's going to appeal to kind of like an A to C1 audience. Now, if we compare that to, again, more of the more mainstream mass audience kind of uh, game shows like Tipping Point, there we're probably looking at more like B down to E. They have mass appeal. Um, people are going to be gratified by the fact that they get some of the questions right, even if it is just occasionally a gaming question or a pop culture question. Um, but that difference in audience is very obvious when we look at the style of questioning. Age is obviously another way that we can look at uh, audiences. So traditionally, Countdown has a slightly older audience. We can see this in terms of like, you know, the choice of hosts, the kind of contestants that we have on. Uh, likewise, you could watch something like Are You Smarter Than a Ten-Year-Old? And everything from the theme tune to the whole premise of the show is aimed at a slightly younger audience. We can also talk about audiences in terms of their psychographics. Now, to do this, we talk about the cross-cultural consumer characterization model. Now, this says that there are seven different types of consumer based on their characteristics. What are the kind of shows they're going to go for? So, for example, you've got the, uh, the aspirers who seek status. You've got um, explorers who, who seek discovery. Now, how does this work in TV game shows? I think if you look at the likes of University Challenge, where you know, there's a great deal of challenge. It's very taxing. It's about being the best. Likewise with Mastermind. This is probably going to appeal to succeeders. Now, a succeeder is someone who seeks control, someone who looks for elitism, being the best in their field, as opposed to perhaps uh, pointless, which would appeal to the mainstream, um, perhaps aspirers, people who, who like the gratification of doing something well. Ninja Warrior, on the other hand, you could argue perhaps there is still that elitism which is going to um, uh, appeal to succeeders, but perhaps also maybe an element of the explorer is, is um, going to be drawn into this show for the whole idea of uh, a new concept, doing something which hasn't been done before. So that's, that's, that's roughly how we can talk about the audience in terms of their age, their demographic, socio socioeconomic model, and the psychographics. But why do they watch TV game shows? For this, we're going to refer to Blomler and Katz's uses and gratification theory. Now, uh, I've got a video which you can watch here, which uh, kind of summarizes the, the whole model in a nutshell. But basically, it, it's, it argues that audiences watch a media text for one of four reasons. Either for entertainment, they just enjoy it. Information, they learn something like the news. Social interaction, in other words, they, they get a sense of that social buzz either with the characters or as they watch it with other people. Or perhaps even personal identity. They associate themselves with the text somehow. Now, I think it's fair to say that actually audiences can kind of be gratified in all four ways by uh, TV game shows. They're very entertaining. Sometimes they're just fun to watch. You could argue you learn something, although you don't access the text to learn it directly. You could argue that you learn from it somewhat. I think the number one reason people are gratified by TV game shows is social interaction. Now, like I said, uh, with the likes of um, Richard Osman and Alexander Armstrong, after you've seen them for a thousand episodes of the show, you get to know them, you get to enjoy their company, you almost see them as friends. But also, think about the social interaction you have with other people on the couch as you watch it at home. It's something that kind of becomes a conduit between you and them. It's something to talk about, you play along, and it becomes a social experience, it's a game. And so, the final key concept we've got to talk about is representations. How the media represents the people, the contestants, the people we see in the show. So. What kind of people are represented as the contestants in TV game shows? 
It goes without saying that if you look at this selection of contestants from Pointless and this selection of contestants from uh, Tipping Point, you'll notice we have a broad spectrum where one contestant might be... I'm a director at a PR agency. And the other contestant might be... I'm a support worker with people with learning disabilities. So we're getting a broad social range here of age, ethnicity, profession. And the reason for this is it allows the audience to relate to someone. There's hopefully on each panel someone that the audience can relate to and then root for, feel like they get to know them and want to find out that resolve. Are they going to win or aren't they? It's why we always get a short time to get to know them at the start of an episode. We find out what their favorite things are, where they've been on holiday. The more the audience is given time to invest in these characters, the more they're going to want to see the show through and find out um, how they do. Then we get the uh, representations of host and TV game shows. Um, now, they, they solve numerous different purposes in TV game shows. First and foremost, they are the narrator. They, they signpost for us. They tell us what's going on, where we're going now, how the, sh how the show is going to progress through different rounds. What you'll find is they're, they're very commonly male. Now, I don't really know why this is. I've given it some thought, and I think it really goes back to the heritage of the show back in the 1950s when you know, men did dominate, you know, film and television. And I think it's more of just one of these things which is taking a little bit of time to change where, yes, we do occasionally get female hosts, but across the board, they, they always seem to be male still. They provide narrative by signposting like this. Best of luck to both pairs. Let's play the head-to-head. -head. They explain the premise of the game in a very few sentences like this. These four people have never met before, but by working as a team, they have the chance to win thousands of pounds. There's just one thing standing in their way, the chaser. They very often are the person that asks the questions. Now, sometimes it might be that they are doing it as the taskmaster and they're almost seen as being opposed to the contestants. Sometimes they are literally just a go-between. As many cases, they act as comic relief. So we have all of these different elements like the sound and the camera angles and the lighting creating tension. And they're there to kind of relieve that tension, make the audience laugh as well as be on the edge of their seat. Sometimes we'll see them act as a support, kind of like a mentor or a coach to the, um, to the contestants and they're actually rooting for them. And ultimately they're there to congratulate them when they win and offer commiserations when they lose. Let's look at Pointless as an example with Alexander Armstrong. Why him for this show? Like we said, it's quite lighthearted. It's quite mainstream. And I think it's because Alexander Armstrong has a history with the BBC. He's established as a comedian. He had a very successful sketch show, Armstrong and Miller. All right, bud. What happened? Because you've done all that work we're supposed to get done for this morning. No matter. I ain't done none of it. You done it? What? Did you call me a nerd and a swat and all this? <laughs> of course I ain't done it. I has nails. <laughs> And it means we take to him easily. We, we like him. We want him on our side. We then have his sidekick or co-presenter, uh, Richard Osmond, who uh, without him, we wouldn't have the banter between the two characters. And like I said earlier, with uses and gratification theory, it's kind of the banter between them and the friendship that we grow to value that gives us a sense of social interaction, something that we enjoy watching every single day. Now let's compare this to University Challenge where the role of the host is completely different and represented very differently. Here we have Jeremy Paxman. Now why him for a show which is very, very much about kind of intensive questioning, intellectual topics? Well, Jeremy Paxman has a background as a no-holds-barred confrontational journalist on Newsnight. He famously had this interview on Newsnight. I was entitled to express my views. I was entitled to be consulted. Did you threaten to overrule I, them? I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis, and I did not instruct him. And did the you truth threaten of, to overrule the, him? The truth of the matter is that Mr. Marriott was not suspended. Did you I did threaten not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten and to I overrule him, Mr. Howard? scrupulously in accordance with that advice. So what we have here is a, is a host who's not so much a support and trying to help the contestants win, he's the taskmaster. He hurries them up if they aren't answering quick enough. He expects the best and he, uh, he doesn't want to mess around. There is a pace and there is a show to complete here. Finally, I want to talk about how celebrities are represented in TV game shows. So as I've said, very often kind of like late at night viewing or maybe on the weekend, you'll often get like a celebrity edition of a TV game show. Now, why do they do this? They do this so that they are represented um, as charitable, very positively. And the, the way they do this is by playing for charities rather than for themselves. 
So again, these will tend to be kind of minor celebrities, you know, soap stars, other TV game show hosts, people like that. And it makes for lighthearted watching. Very often, the fact that these celebrities are in it will draw a bigger crowd. Hence, we've got that six million kind of um, audience on the weekend. But it also means since we're playing for charity, we're going to get easier questions, which makes it easier for them to accumulate money to give to charity, but also easier for the people at home to watch. So it's very, very mainstream. So there you go, guys. I've, I've tried to kind of uh, go over all of the key concepts in some detail as far as TV game shows go. What you need to do now is start researching each of those areas even more. So check out the Twitter pages for these shows yourself. Watch a few episodes and uh, question the mise-en-scene, the lighting, the sound effects. The best thing you can do now is use this as a springboard to um, investigate yourself TV game shows for the, uh, for the exam.